Hi there, Chris, Chapman the Camp. Today we're going to talk about a really exciting, this is my excited face, we're going to talk about a really exciting new helmet from Shui. It is the NXR2 and it is their first ECE2206 accredited helmet. This is the Shui NXR2, replaces the outgoing NXR. It is in essence the same helmet, it's the same concept aimed at the same people. We're gonna come on and talk about all of the detailed changes because there are a lot of changes between this helmet and the old one. But the greatest change of them all is the fact that this new helmet is going to be the very first Shui ever to be accredited to the new safety standard ECE 2206. And that's the biggest change in helmet standards for some 40 years. This is going to be the second ever helmet to market that is a, accredited to that standard. The first one will be the Arai Quantic. We're recording this in April 2021. The new Arai Quantic is due to hit the market in May 2021, so potentially in a few weeks' time. This helmet's going to come to market a little bit later, somewhat later in the year. We'll come back and talk about that. But when both helmets are here in the market, they're going to be direct competitors to one another. They're very similar helmets in a number of respects, and they are very much aimed at the same audience, the same kind of usage. Now, 2206 is a big deal. As I've mentioned, there's been no change to the standard in some 40 years, so it is a change, it is an upgrade that is long overdue. And what I can assure you of is that this is going to usher in a new generation over the coming years, a new generation of safer, far more protective motorcycle helmets. What I want to do, I want to talk a little bit about the role of a helmet, and then I'm going to come on and talk about the tests and what's different about 2206 and why 2206 is a far more rigorous standard than 2205. Arguably, the main role of a motorcycle helmet is to absorb energy in an impact. So what happens when we have an accident, head hits the road, hits a car, hits, God forbid, a tree, whatever it is, there's an impact. And that impact sends the brain flying from one side of the skull across to the other, where it meets the other side of the skull, bounces back. That bouncing causes bruising to the brain, and that can cause brain damage. And what you have to understand is that brain damage is not repairable. You cannot go to hospital and ask them to repair your brain. We can learn to overcome the effects of brain damage, we can learn to live with them, but it cannot be repaired. It's why the helmet is the single most important item of protective wear we'll ever have. The role, therefore, of a helmet is to slow down that movement of the brain, and it does that by absorbing energy in an impact. So when there's an impact, we want the helmet to, as effectively as possible, to absorb that energy and dissipate it around the shell and around the EPS. The idea being that that's going to slow down the movement of the brain across the skull. And if that happens, that's going to set up less possibility of bruising, less possibility of damage. On one level, what's disappointing, or what first seemed disappointing with the new standard, is that the threshold for energy absorption is unchanged. There is a minimum level, a pass level, of the amount of energy that has to be absorbed by a helmet in the tests. What they do, they take the helmet, they drop it down onto an anvil, they put accelerometers into the shell, and they measure the ability to absorb energy. The problem was that the old standard, in some ways, was not massively impressive, because at that pass level, at an acceptable level, there was a very high degree of permanent brain damage, and even a not insignificant degree of possibility of fatal brain damage. So it was not on one level particularly impressive. Now, the new standard has the same threshold, but it is in some ways, or in every way, it is improved because under the new test, the drop test, when they drop the helmet onto an anvil, the height from which they drop the helmet, the speed with which it impacts with the anvil is higher. So even though the threshold's the same, it is actually improved because they're reaching that at a higher speed. Another thing under the new test, under the old test, this impact test that measured energy absorption was in five preset points on a helmet. And what that did, that set up the possibility that unscrupulous manufacturers could reinforce a helmet in those five known points. So under 2206, they've added 12 extra points and the testers can choose at random three of those 12 points. So there are now eight tests 
from a total of 17. And in truth, no manufacturer is going to reinforce a helmet in 17 different locations. That would be crazy. They might as well go the whole hog and just make a proper helmet, make a safer helmet. There's another test, another important test, although it might sound on one level slightly counterintuitive. There is a test at a lower speed, so where they drop the helmet from a lower height onto an anvil. And that's because some helmets have shells that are just too hard. They do not absorb energy until they hit something at a great speed. So this new test, they drop it from a lower speed, and this is meant to simulate accidents at 20, 30 miles an hour, even in the car park. You can still do yourself a lot of damage at those low speeds, but you need a helmet that even at low speeds, at lower impact levels, is going to absorb energy. So the new test will make it harder for helmets with overly hard and rigid shells to pass that test. So an important extra element to the test. There's a third test that is very important. It's been much discussed in recent years. Arai have always spoken about their helmets, their round shells and glancing off. And it's now accepted that the rotational forces when you have an angled impact can also cause brain damage as the brain twists within the skull. It can create tears and so on. That can also create brain damage. So under the 2206 test, there's now an angled test where the helmet is dropped onto a 45 degree anvil and that's going to measure the rotational forces and obviously there's a threshold for those. There are also more rigidity tests. Now a rigidity test is a, a test where basically they crush the helmet to make sure that it's strong enough if something runs over the helmet. But under the new test, if when they're doing the impact test, if the shell breaks in any way, if it doesn't withstand the energy impact test, then they have to test it again to make sure that it still won't crush because there's obviously a scenario where you hit the ground, the helmet splits, and therefore there is a scenario in which it's then not going to be strong enough if something then runs over you. So the new test has much more rigorous crushing and rigidity tests built into it. Lots of other tests. We can't go into them all today, but there's a new visor test to test the strength of the visor if a stone hits you at speed. There's also going to be a test for impacts for helmets that have accessories built in. So helmets that have, for example, a built-in comm system, they're going to test in those areas to make sure that that doesn't affect the ability to absorb energy and so on. If protection, bottom line here is, if protection of your head is important, and I cannot imagine who on earth is going to say that it's not, then you are going to want to be wearing in the coming years a 2206 helmet. If you want to know more about the test, we have done a video about it, it goes into much more depth than we're able to do here, but go and watch our video, it's on our YouTube channel. That will tell you all of the things that are important in the 2206 regime and why you really need to be looking in the coming years and getting yourself a 2206 helmet. The NXR2, as indeed did the NXR1, the old NXR, form part of what should we call their sport line. The sport line was aimed at sporty riders, as the name would suggest, and what that means is those helmets come without facilities like a drop-down sun visor and without built-in comms facilities. And that's, I suppose, because people on those kind of bikes are less bothered about those. They want lightness at the expense of anything else. So their sport line helmets do not have those things built in. This helmet, not per se, I would say, a track helmet, although if you were doing track work, this is a perfectly acceptable helmet to wear. You'd be very happy wearing one of these, but it's certainly the kind of helmet that you'd be looking at if you rode a sports bike on the road. Should we actually talk about this helmet being a sports touring helmet? I suppose what I would say is if that's the case, and it is the case, this helmet would sit more at the sport end of the market, whereas their GTA, now the GTA 2, would sit more at the touring end. The shell, the construction, it's the same as the old NXR. It's an AIM shell. AIM stands for Advanced Integrated Matrix. It means it's a combination. It's made up from a combination of organic and composite fibers. And that leads to a shell that is light, strong, and energy absorbing. But you might say, well, that's what every shell is. And that is the case. But all shells differ a little bit. So for example, we have Arai. Arai have super thick, super strong shells, compensated for by an extra thick EPS, but that's just a facet of Arai's. Sharp helmets, on the other hand, have very soft, energy absorbing shells. What this helmet is, it sits right in the middle. This is in some ways, we think, the perfect combination. 
The bit inside the outer shell, that's the EPS, the stuff that absorbs energy, in this helmet it is multi-density. And what that means is the outer part is softer so that if you have a lower speed impact it's going to absorb energy easily and in a higher speed impact the EPS that's further towards the head is harder so it can absorb that energy of a higher impact. The EPSs where they fit together they've got channels in and the air, the venting, the air that comes in the vents passes between those layers and I'm going to come on and talk about that later about why that's important. One of the exceptional things about the NXR was the same on the NXR1 but it's the case here as well is that it comes in four shell sizes. Our definition of a premium helmet is that it comes in three shell sizes. That's what most top brands come in. Shark, which we still consider to be a premium brand, comes in only two shell sizes. So to have four shell sizes in a full face helmet is still exceptional. But what does that do? Well, on average, it allows the helmet to fit a little bit better. It also makes the helmet, and of course, helmets are not about how we look in them, even though a lot of people who come in here when they buy a helmet, they spend a lot of time looking at themselves in the mirror. That's not what a helmet's about. But a helmet with more shell sizes is going to fit closer to the head. It's going to be a little bit more compact. And I can illustrate that by talking about a helmet that, say, and there are helmets out there that come in only one shell size. So that shell size is big because it has to be to fit the largest head. And if you have some humongous size head, it'll work fine. But if you've got that helmet and a smaller head, they pack it out with more EPS and more padding until it looks increasingly ridiculous. So the more shell sizes you have, the better the fit and the better the helmet looks in a way. This particular helmet, across the four shell sizes, extra, extra small and extra small, share a shell size. Medium has its own shell size. Large has its own shell size. And then XL and double XL share a shell size. Initially, and we think this is a shame, but the NXR2 will not come to the UK in the extra, extra small size. And that is a shame because the old NXR, we didn't do it as a main range helmet, but we did often get it in for ladies because it was super light and went down to a very small size. So initially, disappointing. This helmet is not going to come to the UK in the double extra small. It will do over time. In terms of the helmet, it weighs 50 grams more than the old NXR1. In truth, that's not a lot. That's two ounces in old money. It doesn't make a lot of difference. The increase in weight is being put down by Shuey to the extra demands of 2206. But what they also are at pains to point out is that on the move, the greater or the better aerodynamics of this helmet means that as you're traveling along, it creates 4% less drag and 6% less lift. So even though it is marginally he heavier, and it is marginally, once you're on the bike, it just won't feel it. The GT Air 2, which is, I don't think, a super heavy helmet, that's 1,500 grams as opposed to the 1,400 grams of this helmet. So we can see the NXR is certainly not what you would call a lardy helmet. With this helmet, as with all shoes, we're going to have the ability to pull out the cheek pads and the headliner. And that's important because... It means that we can basically tailor the helmet to fit you. So in every size, there will be, for example, a 35mm cheek pad, and we can go for a 31 or a 39. The liner will be 9mm, and we can go for a 13 or a 5, depending on your size. So it's always been one of the most marketable features of a Shoei that we can change the cheek pads to get the fit absolutely perfect. There is a difference, however, between the NXR2 and the NXR1. It's actually a different shaped helmet. It curves down towards the bottom of the neck and the cheek pads are thicker and this has been designed to put more of a squeeze on the cheek so if you had an NXR1 the NXR2 is going to feel a little bit different it's going to be it's going to give you a bigger push on the cheeks and it's going to feel tighter around the neck roll now that's always good a tighter fit here tighter fit here we don't want around the head because that can cause headaches but a tighter fit around the cheeks and around the neck that's always going to be good because that's going to make for a safer helmet in this case I think those changes are not about safety per se. I'm not even sure that they're anything to do with ECE 2206. I think they're about making this helmet a quieter helmet. So here we've got both helmets. We've got the old helmet, the NXR1, as we're now going to call it. This is the NXR2. I wanted them both here so we could compare and contrast some of the features, some of the upgrades. The visor on the new helmet is improved in a number of respects. 
I think as a rider, the thing that you're going to notice most is that this has a center closing mechanism rather than the side mechanism that we had on the NXR1. I think it's an improvement because this is a very definitive lock position. Once it's in place, you can't pull it open. It means it's going to be safe, more secure. It's not going to get blown open and open in the wind when you do a, um, a lifesaver, for example. Not that I'm suggesting that that would happen easily on an NXR1, but it's just a more secure position. I think it's going to pull it in more definitively against the beading. I did see a review on Revzilla. We are big fans. I'm big fans of Revzilla. I wish I could do things anywhere near as well as those guys. But they reckoned when they reviewed the helmet, because they have the helmet over there. Over there, it's called the RF1400. It's not the ECE version because they work to Dot and Snell over there, but it's in essence the same helmet, it's the same cosmetics. And what they reckoned was that they didn't like this mechanism as much on this helmet. Personally, I disagree. I have a feeling that sometimes what Revzilla do, they praise a product and then they need to find some little niggle that they're not completely happy with. And I think, think that they just happened upon this as a mechanism. But actually, I think it's a better mechanism. I think even with a gloved hand, it's easier to use. There is another benefit. If you've got a side mechanism here, over time, it creates a twisting on the mechanism, on the mechanism that controls the visor. And what is that? What that is going to do eventually, it's going to distort the way the visor sits against the beading. It's going to affect the seal. And that, over time, is going to create noise and could allow water to come in. So in essence, I disagree. I prefer this visor. I think once you've got used to the new way of using it, it's just a better system. The visor itself is improved. And this does come down, I'm pretty sure, to ECE 2206. In my preamble, I did mention that there was a new test for visors. In essence, they fire a pellet at the helmet. It has to withstand an even stronger or higher speed impact. So that's why there's a new visor here on this helmet. It's technically known, just in case you're interested, as the CWR F2 visor. And in essence, it's just more rigid. At the side here, near the mechanism, there are some little lumpy bits. We'll do a close up and look at these, but they are known as vortex generators. We've seen them on other helmets. We've seen them on Schubert helmets where they're often around the brow of the visor. And the idea is that they break up the wind to create less noise. Can't really tell whether they work, and I'm sure if I rode in this helmet, I still couldn't tell, but I've got to believe that this has been through the wind tunnel, and if Shui tell us that they reduce noise, I'm sure they do. One of the things that I think is far easier to discern is the crack position on this visor, and I think it is absolutely fantastic. Now, those of you who ride a lot, you will know the benefits of a crack position, and in essence, it's when you are hot, it's cold outside, the helmet visor might be starting to mist a little bit and you just want to get a little bit of cold air just to clear the visor. You don't want to open the visor way up because if you're traveling at speed, that's going to be a blast in your eyes. That's going to be the last thing, thing you want. So you just want a definitive crack position. A bit of air comes in, you leave it open for a couple of seconds, and then you close it and the helmet has cleared. Many manufacturers talk about having a crack position on their helmets, but all too often, there's not a crack position. There's just a bit of a gap when you don't finally click the visor into place. And I don't call that a proper crack position. This has a proper crack position and I think it's pretty much perfect. The visor closes using a system we've seen on a number of Shui helmets. It's called the VAS system, the variable axis system. What it means is that as the visor comes down, it's not a linear movement. As you reach the final position, it comes back in towards the helmet again to seal the visor against the beading and against the helmet. And all of that, the end point being to prevent water ingress to make the helmet quieter. This helmet has another element, however. It existed in a way on the previous helmet, but it's far more usable here. We have a system that can be used by hand. You don't need a tool for it, but it enables you to fine tune the fit of the visor against the beading. So it's just a little bit more accessible. The helmet, as do all Shui helmets, comes with a pinlock visor. Should we call it a Pinlock Evo? It, it covers the entire area of the visor. We know it, or it's the equivalent to a Pinlock 120, so that's obviously the best possible Pinlock. In the NXR2, it's 10% larger than it was on the NXR1, so that's got to be good. They've also moved the pins further around so that they are totally out of the line of sight. In terms of the venting, 
we've got a slightly more obvious and usable chin vent. So it was a little bit fiddly on the NX, NXR1, the same kind of thing, but it's just a little bit easier to use, especially once you've got gloved hands, as it were. Up here, we have, again, I think this is more usable. This was okay on the NXR1, but at times difficult, I think, to know exactly where you were. Here, there's a definitive open and closed position. But importantly, on the NXR2, there are now two inlets, whereas on the NXR1, there was just one. You've also got these two brow vents, these two slider brow vents on the side. Mentioned already that the EPS, the layers of EPS on this helmet, have channels for the air to flow through. So what happens with the helmet, the way that it clears itself to take hot air out, the air comes in here, flows through the EPS, there are holes in the underneath of the EPS that draws heat out of the helmet, and the air exhausts through this, or through this spoiler, through vents underneath this spoiler. Should we tell us that this is a new visor, it's a larger, more aerodynamic spoiler that allows 50% more air to pass through it. So that's obviously got to be a good thing. On this helmet, however, as opposed to the NXR1, on the NXR1 we had an open and closed position. This is permanently open. But I have to say, when would you ever want to close an exhaust vent? If you don't want air to come to the helmet, it's very simple. You close the front vents. But I cannot see a scenario in which you want to block air that's come in, either when these are open or closed. I can't understand why you would ever want to block air leaving the helmet. So as far as we're concerned, having a permanently open exhaust vent just makes sense. In terms of the other stuff, I've got to say the rest is kind of detail. We've got the EQR flaps here so that somebody, a first responder, if you have an accident, can pull these out easily. They can just look for the red tabs, pull those out, gives them better access to your airways and so on. We've got things like the double D-ring system, which is much favored over here. But in most other respects, as I've already intimated, it's like the NXR1. It's just improved in a number of little areas. No two ways about it, the NXR2 is a fabulous helmet. Talking with the UK importer, they have told us that the NXR has for many years been their best seller. And I have to say, I kick myself for the fact that we haven't offered it to our customers before. And I think that was probably because it came from the sport line. We've never seen ourselves as a company that was oriented towards sports bikes, so probably we didn't carry it. But I think now looking back, that was probably a mistake. Certainly in the guise of the NXR2, this is not what I would call an aggressive sports helmet. Even Shui tell us that it's aimed at the sports touring market. And I can see we've got lots of customers who ride sport touring bikes, but I can see guys even on Nakeds wanting to ride with this helmet. For some, clearly, the GTR2 is going to be the more obvious choice because certainly a lot of our customers are commuters, and if you're commuting in and out of the sun, this sun visor comes into its own. Some people will prefer the ability to have an integrated comm system. But some others will be prepared to trade off those facilities for the lightness of the NXR2. And I kind of suspect that for a number of the reasons that we've discussed today, the NXR2 is going to be somewhat quieter than the GTR2. The GTR2 is not a noisy helmet, not as quiet maybe as the Neotech, but I have a feeling this is going to be a very quiet helmet. What is beyond doubt is that the NXR2 is better than the NXR1 in so many respects, probably every respect. It's a more aerodynamic helmet. It's going to fit better. It's going to have a safer fit. It is a better fented helmet. But the biggest improvement of all is the fact that it is an ECE 2206 helmet. And that's going to make this one of the safest, most protective helmets that you can buy. This year, the only other 2206 helmet that you're going to be able to access, and we've mentioned this already, is the Arai Quantic. Very similar helmet. If you're looking at both helmets, however, you can't base your decision purely on looks and even on features because they have a slightly different head fit. Now, we use these in the shop when we're talking to customers about head fits, and these are exaggerated. In essence, the Shui and the Arai have a, an oval fit, but the fit on an Arai is slightly rounder. So some people may be equally comfortable in both helmets, but some people will find that the shoe is going to work much better on them. Some people will find that the Arai is going to work better. However, the problem is this. If you want to compare the two head-to-head, back-to-back, as it were, you can't do that for some time because the 
NXR2 is not going to arrive into the UK until at some point in September. Obviously, it could be laid. We hope not. In terms of pricing, there is a bit of a differential between the two helmets. The Shui in white, for example, will be £430. The Arai in white is going to be £500. So up to you to decide whether that's a deciding factor. Normally, at this end of the market, £70 doesn't make a huge amount of difference. Clearly, the graphic versions are going to be more expensive again. If you'd like to see more Shui helmets, then visit the website motorlegends.com. If you'd like to learn more about the NXR2, then if you click on one of the links on the screen, sometimes they're up there, sometimes they're down there, that will take you directly to the relevant page on the website. When you're there, you can check out the spec in a bit more detail, you can check on availability, and obviously if you want to buy the helmet, even though it's not coming for a while, you can do that there and then. When you buy from us, we try to make the process simple, straightforward and risk-free as we possibly can. There's no delivery charge on any item of protected where you buy from us. Returns are totally free. And what's more, we give you a full 12 months in which to decide whether you do want to return something to us. We have the best price promise in the business. Now, John Lewis is rightly famed for its never knownly undersold price promise. We go one stage better. If you can find anybody selling anything that we sell at a price that is lower than ours, we will beat that retailer's price by a full 10%. If the retailer is in the EU and not in the UK, we will match their landed price. Now, there are a few terms and conditions associated with our price beat, nothing particularly onerous, but if you are going to price beat us, I suggest you visit the website and check out what those terms and conditions are. If in the future you'd like to receive bulletins from us about new products, our new product launches, then if you go to the website, at the top of every page, there's a piece of script that says newsletter sign up. Click on there, within seconds you'll be in business. In future, you'll receive our email bulletins. If however you prefer to get your information videographically, that is to say in this form, we would be simply delighted if you want to become a subscriber to a YouTube channel. And you can do that by clicking on the button below. Now, this is 2021. Last year, 2020, we gave away to one of our YouTube subscribers a 125cc Mutt motorcycle. It was a bike that we'd messed around a bit and had converted to look something like a Steve McQueen desert sled. This year, 2021, we've gone a little bit up market. We're gonna be giving away a 250cc Fantic Caballero Scrambler. But we are not going to give it away to a YouTube subscriber. We're going to give it away to somebody who follows us on Facebook. We're going to be giving the bike away at some point just before Christmas this year. So if you want to stand a chance of winning this fabulous little machine, then go over to Facebook and obviously follow us. I'd like to finish with a play for our fabulous little shop here at Motor Legends. We are based about a mile from the centre of town, a mile from the railway station. And as I've suggested, it's a small shop. The footprint is small, but it's attached to our warehouse where we have more than £2 million worth of stock arranged over three floors. Technically, that makes us the second largest motorcycle apparel shop in the UK. But we think we, we are far more than just the amount of merchandise we have here in the building. We're all about service. We're all about personal, personal fitting. If you want to check us out, visit Trustpilot. We have the highest five-star ranking in the business. When you come to see us, we'll serve you only the finest Italian Illy coffee, or we'll serve you proper Yorkshire tea in a proper teapot. And who knows, if you're lucky, you might even get to sample one of Mark's sister's famous motorcycle-shaped gingerbread biscuits. Anyway, this has been Chris. I hope to talk to you again soon.